the sales process you need to have with Jordan Ostroff, episode 275. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Profit with Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today we have a replay for one of the sessions of our annual planning Best Year Ever 2022 event. If you want to access the video version of this episode, as well as all the other topics that were covered during this event, as well as links to the downloadables from the speakers, you definitely want to go check that out at ProfitWithLaw.com forward slash planning replay profitwithlaw.com forward slash planning replay we will also have that linked up in the show notes below this episode as well as on our website profitwithlaw.com and without further ado here is that session all right so we're looking at they're going to learn about you they're going to vet you there's going to be first contact you're going to do some sort of consultation and then it's going to be decision time we're really looking at it from these different eight steps and before I dive into these, does this sound like your practice? You have a month where you sign up a bunch of clients, you get super busy, and then you don't do any follow-up, so you don't sign up that many clients the next month, so then you have more time to do the follow-up so that you sign up a bunch of clients, and you have the crazy ebbs and flows. That's why we're calling this the sustainable sales process, because it is going to overcome that issue. So the first thing, learning about you, the ad, or what is a lead? This can be from ads, it can be from networking, it can be from social media posts, YouTube, I don't care what it is but it is somebody who has shown some sort of interest in your company's product or service in some way, shape, or form. So how do we generate leads? This is my five-step process. You need to know your ideal client. You need to know what they will do when they need a lawyer. You're gonna be where they already are. You're gonna be where they are going to go when they need you. And you're gonna connect with the people that they go to for help. So when we're talking about ads versus networking versus social media versus YouTube, it really comes down to your client. Are they going to search on Google? Are they going to search on YouTube? Are they going to go to somebody and ask for a referral? Whatever it is along those lines. So that's going to be our first step. They're going to learn about you through something that you have done or somebody that you have connected with. Now, the question becomes, what do they know about you already? So this is going to be different based upon your lead type. For example, if it's a referral, they spoke to somebody who hopefully knows a decent amount of, about you. If you did a webinar marketing, something along those lines, hopefully they watched it. What do they already know about you? If they just got your name from you know, word of mouth, they might know nothing about you. If they had an hour long conversation with a friend who had previously hired you, they might know everything. So from that original point of contact, what are they gonna do? Realistically, they're gonna vet you on Google. They're gonna look at your reviews. They're gonna check out your website. Um, if they clicked on an ad, maybe they went to the landing page. Maybe they're gonna call the firm. So you need to make sure you're putting the right step forward so that you don't lose great clients immediately in that stage. If somebody raved about you as the best attorney they've ever dealt with and they went to your website and it looks like it was built in 1996 on GeoCities, you're gonna have a problem. So now while they're vetting you, think about what extra info do they need? What do they wanna see about you and your firm? For the most part, I think it's reviews, social proof. We all are selling a service. As far as I know, none of us lawyers have a product so how do we know that we are going to be the right fit based upon social proof, based upon having 50 reviews of people saying how great we are, 100, 150, or 1,000, whatever it's going to be. Maybe it's awards, um, and obviously as a lawyer, you know, we all know the, the BS ones you can buy, but maybe there are real awards that actually matter to a client. Maybe you wrote a book, maybe you were published somewhere, something along those lines. And here's where you're going to make sure you're being consistent. You want to make sure that the marketing that you are doing is consistent with the sales process we're talking about here. So if you want to be a high value, high touch, you've got to be that the whole way through. You can't have you know, spammy ads. You can't have no follow-up, et cetera. You need to make sure that you are being consistent throughout the whole sales process. All right, so now they're going to vet you. Maybe they went to the website, they headed the landing page, they Googled you, they called the office. And again, be consistent, share helpful info, get great reviews. It is okay for you to vet people out ASAP. 
because ultimately a lead has no value until they hire you. And in fact, leads have negative value the more that you spend time vetting them. So during that first connection, whether it's them checking out a landing page, whether it's them calling the office, if they are not a good fit for you as a client, the faster you get them out of your sales process, the more time, money, and energy you save going into it later to realize that they are not a great fit. So whether you charge for consults or not, whether you have them fill out a questionnaire or not, that is up to you. My two cents are if you're getting too many bad leads and you want to value your time more, you put more hoops for them to jump through. If you don't have enough leads and you need to spend more time on them, then remove some of the hoops that you've put in in that process getting to a consultation with you or calling the office or booking that consult. All right, so now when they are doing this vetting, you need to get back to them ASAP. I don't, there probably are a few of us that actually are truly experts that somebody will wait on. For the most part, I like the John Morgan theory that we are plumbers and the first person who answers the phone who sounds competent is going to get the sale. So especially for PI, especially for criminal defense, especially for emergency family law stuff, if they are, if you are doing reactive law where something happened and they need you ASAP, you have to get back to them quickly. Answer the phone, return calls, respond to messages. Um, if you have too much difficulty with that, our next speaker is Maddie Martin, smith.ai, phenomenal way for you to solve a lot of these problems. You also want to make sure you're communicating on several channels. Some people will want to call, some people want to email, text, social media message. It kills me every time I talk to an attorney who is running a ton of paid for ads and exposure on social media, who then doesn't have a good process to respond to the messages, who expects the client to click that link and then call the office and go somewhere else when they're already on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram. So make sure that you are responding on the channels that fit the marketing you're doing. You want to put together a consistent follow-up schedule. I'm a huge fan of automating this process. Why? Because at this point, before you've ever talked to them, you're probably going to have a lot of leads that may not be the right fit, may not be able to afford you, may not be in the right area. So the more that you can get in front of them to vet them out automatically, you can do it quicker, you can do it cheaper, and you can do it more consistently. So I'm not saying that you are not going to be personal with this, but if you're sending a couple emails or having them fill out a form that says, were you injured? Is it in the right you know, geographic area? Is it in the right practice area? Something like that. I am totally fine with you automating that so that you have the most amount of time to actually spend on the consultation and then actually spend on the client experience and the actual work. And again, I go back to don't spend too much time chasing bad leads. If you have a very specific ideal client who is proactive and responsive, if you're spending 30 days you know, tracking somebody down, they're probably not going to be great and proactive and responsive when they become a client. All right, so now we've got that first contact, phone call. Um, you have to make sure your staff and you are answering the phone correctly. I would suggest have friends call your office and see how it sounds when somebody answers the phone. There, you would be surprised at how difficult it is to get a hold of certain law firms. You would be surprised at how disinterested a lot of people answer the phone are, and that's the experience that every client is getting. So please, please, please don't have a link tree for your calls or a phone tree. Press one for this, press two for this person, whatever. Get somebody to answer it quickly. Make sure it is answered and make sure they're actively listening to the person. So the better that they have that first point of contact, that first initial phone call, the easier it's gonna be for you the rest of the time. Now you need to make sure they're asking good questions. So having an intake form, the more that you have that ideal client, the more consistent you are running the same cases over and over again, the same question should come up. I am a fan of screening the case as quickly as possible. It is you as the attorney's job to decide whether or not it's a good case but it is your staff or your answering services job to determine whether or not it is a potential case. So if it is not your practice area, if it is not your geographic area, if they don't have the money to hire you, screen them out as quickly as possible. The goal of that first call probably is gonna have them book a consultation. Maybe it's them filling out a questionnaire, but really understand what you want coming out of that first phone call. It'll make it a lot easier. Save the time and money now, vet it out. Don't spend an hour consultation to find out it's not a good fit. And then you can pre-sell the client. It is amazing to me the power of a receptionist or intake person explaining how great of an attorney you are before that consult. Oh my God, you know, Mrs. So-and-so had a case like this just last week, got an amazing result for the client. This is the review that they left us, something along those lines. Obviously, it needs to be true, but the little things like that can go a long way as opposed to somebody who answers the phone completely disinterested. Okay, I'll book you. I'll check the calendar. That's not going to fly. 
All right, so now you get to your consultation, whether it's free, whether it's paid, whether it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever. You need to make sure that you are confirming the consultation with them. And again, this should be automated. You can use Calendly, you can use Schedule Once, you can use Lawmatics, you can use any sort of CRM. They need to know what they need to do to have a great consult. They need to know what you need for it to be a great consult. And then what else they need to know about your firm. So I tell everybody you want to be ready for three different kinds of consults, in-person, virtual, so Zoom or something like that, and a phone call. Even if it's COVID time, even if you're not seeing people in person, just be ready for all those things. Have those emails ready to go. Have that process ready to go. So for in-person, they need your address, parking info, et cetera. For Zoom, they need the link, the program to download it, something along those lines. And then phone call, what number are you calling from? Uh, if people are like me, they will screen their calls extensively. So make sure they know to expect a call from a specific number. And then between that first point of contact and the consult, what do they need to know? I'm a huge fan of at this point, you are trying to convince them to hire a lawyer, period. Whether you were sending them emails, text messages, or calling to check in between that process, I think you want to push them needing to hire a lawyer. So why, what a case looks like. If you've got an ebook or lead magnet about your practice area, great. What to look for in the right lawyer, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It should be things that you fit. It should be, check, it should be boxes that you yourself check. How a lawyer helps, social proof, so sending them some of your best reviews. I especially love any reviews that compare you to another lawyer. And I don't think it'll be like, you know, lawyer so-and-so was better than lawyer so-and-so. But we had a client who hired us who left the review that said, the best attorney I've had on any of my cases. And I thought that was, uh, I guess, unfortunate they've had to hire an attorney multiple times, but an awesome way for us to show somebody who's actually experienced other attorneys. So find your two or three best reviews and make sure they are automated in an email or a text to your client for them to check it out. And then the other thing I love is talking about mistakes people make with their case, especially at the beginning. They wait to hire an attorney and the surveillance video gets overridden. They don't do this and something changes and you can't get a hold of a witness. You know, the police report gets destroyed. I don't know, something along those lines. But again, I think at that point you're talking about they need to hire an attorney, period. And then during the consult, you can talk about why you're the best fit and then you'll follow up after that and we'll talk about that. So when you are sending reminders, please, please, please make sure they go out at a reasonable time. I promise you, if you have a text set at 2 a.m. to one of your clients, it's probably not gonna go over well. Even if it was a DUI client, even if they called you at 2 or 3 a.m., just make sure you're sending them during business hours. Um, I think you wanna send an appointment reminder at least 20, uh, 24 hours before and then follow up on a shorter period of time. It's gonna be a lot easier for people to show up. And then really, you just gotta test a lot of these things. If you're getting a ton of no-shows, test sending more things. If you're here having clients say, oh my God, I got so many messages from you about showing up to this, um, you know, that was a little overwhelming, take some of them back, but really try it, keep tracking. Uh, there's a couple things in other industries, there wasn't really anything in the legal industry, so think about what your client wants. Think about what they're gonna do during their day and put yourself in their shoes when it comes to when you send the reminders and how, whether it's text, phone, email, I would suggest a mix of all three, but you can make that determination. All right, so now, you did your consult. You are gonna get them to sign a contract. Please, 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 please have them sign an actual contract. Um, I have talked to some attorneys that don't have a contract. It never goes over well for you. Even if you're never going to sue clients, having a written contract is super helpful. That goes over the scope of work, that goes over the cost and fees, that goes over the expectation of each party, especially if you just expect your client to do nothing more but update you about their phone number or their address changing or anything, or their job changing, whatever it is, make sure you have that written out and explain to them. And don't write it in legalese. Like as much as a joke that is with us being legalese marketing, um, don't write your contract in legalese to the extent that you can. The more that you make it sound like lawyer jargon, the more clients are gonna think you're trying to hide something and pull something over on them. The easier you make it understandable and the shorter you make it, the easier it will be for them to read it and build trust with you from that contract. So spelling it out super easy will make more people sign it and automatically and immediately give you more respect for the fact that they can understand your contract. E-sign. At this point, if you've been through COVID for this long and you don't have e-sign, I, I kinda go back and forth on if I'm impressed or terrified. So please have e-sign. And I promise you, as you transition to e-sign or as you make it more consistent, anytime anybody else ever makes you sign something not in e-signature, 
you're going to get that gut reaction of, I don't understand why they don't have eSign. That's how your clients feel about your firm if you don't have eSign. Please, please, please make it easy. Um, ideally, the best eSign platforms will text message it to somebody's phone and they can pull it up there and just sign it right there. They don't even have to download anything. They don't need another app, whatever it is. That's going to be the easiest and best practice for the majority of our clients. If a client wants to be more old school, if you're doing estate planning for people who are ultra wealthy, you can always have a paper contract if they're coming in. You can always mail them something. You can make it nice. But please have the ability to have e-sign regardless because there will be that situation where somebody's out of town, where there's an emergency, where it's late one day, where it's this time of year going to the holidays and you know the mail service is down for so long, and have a way where they can sign it ASAP. I suggest you have this entire process set up automatically. It goes to them during your consult and then you walk them through it during the consult. Because what will happen is they will have objections. I need to hear from so-and-so. I'm waiting on this, blah, blah, blah. You can address a lot of those by having the contract there in front of them and by actually making them go through it. If they need to talk to their spouse or family member or parent or child, great. Call them right now. Let's get them in here. Let's have a three-way call. Let's add them to the Zoom, whatever it's going to be. That's going to be your best chance to close them. And I am not telling you to do anything use car salesman-wise. I'm telling you if you allow them the opportunity to leave, and if you don't send the contract, and if they're waiting on that, it's going to be that much easier for another attorney to make this process as smooth and seamless as possible. And if you truly believe that you are the best fit, and if you truly understand that you are a phenomenal attorney, and if you truly believe that you are going to be the best fit for their case, you have a moral imperative for them to hire you. You are doing them a disservice if you let them hire another attorney solely because that attorney made their sales process easier than you did. And I hope that sits with you the right way. I am not telling you to be spammy. I'm telling you to be a great attorney, but if somebody else is a worse attorney, but they are a better salesperson, you're going to lose cases to them and it's going to stink for you and it's going to stink for the client. All right. So now decision time, the goal here, well, get them to hire you, right? So this is where you're talking about why they should choose you. Why you? Why your firm? Why your experience? How do you do things differently? I still love doing the life cycle of a case. I still love sending an ebook or lead magnet if you've got something that talks about you. I still love talking about your firm being different. I still love talking about how you can help. And I still love talking about social proof. But this is where you really drive it home after that consultation with the follow-up if they didn't sign ASAP about why you're the best fit, about why your firm's amazing, about the results that your firm's gotten about what makes you different than other firms. This is where you really, really, really drive that part home. And again, automated email, text, follow up for some calls to check in. Because here's the thing, the more that you automate this process, the more you're gonna have those one or two clients who need a second consult, who really have a serious question that you need to answer, who really have some specific things to follow up. If you're spending two hours on every single lead doing this follow up, you don't have the time for that extra half an hour conversation, that extra 15 minute phone call. Whereas by automating this, you can actually make everybody's experience a little bit more personalized for the people who need it. And bonus marketing tip. As you get the same questions from clients over and over again, those become great pieces of content to make. Those become the FAQ email that you send to them at some point. Those become the videos on for YouTube whatever it's gonna be, when you get the same questions over and over again, that's what your ideal client is actually concerned about, so you can address those in, contact, in content, and you can address that in the consultation. When people talk about, especially for PI, when, 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 and how much am I gonna get, those become great things to answer during the consult. Those become great things to send to them beforehand. That becomes a way to figure out about this follow-up sequence being right for your ideal client based upon the questions you're getting over and over again. All right. So before we move into what's next, I want to talk to you for a couple minutes on the benefit of all of this. Let's say hypothetically you are running 50 Google ads, right? They are the same platform, just different ad sets. If you have these tracked correctly, you should be able to see which ad gets which click, goes to a different landing page or goes to a different contact form or has a different call rail phone number so you can track it. Then they go into the same follow-up sequence. You have the same emails that go to them. You have the same timeline. You have the same time when they get calls back. You have a script for that callback. You do a very similar consultation. Obviously, it changes based upon the case, but the experience is very similar. And then at the end of that, you determine whether or not the client hires you. That's how you will find the most success with sales and marketing. By having the sales process consistent, you can see the ad being the difference. That's your variable. 
all of this is an art because we are talking about people, but the more that you can make it a science, the easier you can tweak those ads. If you are running 15 different marketing campaigns and you have no consistent follow-up process, you're gonna have those months where you do a better job, you're gonna have those months where you do a worse job, and from that, you're gonna think that certain ads are better when really they're not. So by standardizing your sales process, you can truly make the right decisions about your marketing. To go back to that example running you know, the 15 different Google ads, you should be able to know that ad two got you the most clicks, but ad four got you the highest close rate, but ad six got you the fewest clicks, but ad eight got you the most tire kickers. And then you decide to pull money from some of the ads, put it into other ones, and make those tweaks all backed by the same sales process over and over again so you truly know the impact that each of your marketing is having or, or which referral sources are best or which topics get you the best uh, cases from social media or which YouTube videos get the most watches from people who actually want to hire you as opposed to people that just want to learn how to do this themselves. That's all by having the same consistent sales process. All right, so now we're going into what's next. What do they need to do after they hire you? They need to make sure that they made the right decision. After somebody hires, one of two things happens. Either A, they subconsciously convince themselves they made a great decision, or two, they immediately get buyer's remorse. So how do you make them do number one and not number two? By having a good onboarding, by setting the expectations correctly, by getting whatever documents from them quickly, by updating them on the team, by explaining them what happens next, by being proactive. Because you will have clients that might be the happiest with you in this exact moment, even if their case is gonna take six or eight months, and if hypothetically their neighbor gets the same issue that they had and they love you for the first 45 days, they're probably gonna send you that referral. If you're waiting until you wow them with your work at the end of your case, you're losing out on a potential referral source, you're losing out on them writing you a review, a review very quickly, you're losing out on them having a positive experience the entire way through, as opposed to focusing on a great sales pitch and then providing great work. You really need to make that more consistent across the whole flow. So that's what I got here. And again, the benefit of that sales process is to truly understand your marketing super well. Um, I've got my link tree on the QR code on the left, and then we've got some other free resources in the QR code in the middle. If anybody needs, you can pull out your phone and just stick it up to those. And if anybody has questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. I know we've got about five minutes or so. Well, thank you so much, Jordan. This was incredible. Uh, walking through that process, you make it look really, really easy. Um, the truth is, is that there's some effort involved to get this going. And uh, it really takes commitment to the process. So you kind of need to believe that the end result is worth it in order to go into this, because it's going to require you to really think through what you're doing. And people like to just do and not really create processes around it. Uh, but once you have the process, uh, it can really empower you. I mean, you just gave one example where if you start spending money on paid marketing and you're, you're running ads, you, it allows you to really know what the results of the ads are uh, because you, you have the same thing happening after they come through that ad. Uh, so you can really measure. You don't have to worry, well, did this get different results because we treated them differently than the person before? And I also love what you said about uh, the immediate, immediate experience. Um, buyer's remorse is a real thing. Uh, even me in, in my coaching business, when somebody signs on as a coaching client, uh, within 24 hours, I'm sending them a video and welcoming them in and, and, you know, and, and telling them how, how much they, you know, they made a good decision uh, because they need to hear that. They need that reinforcement. Uh, when I signed uh, uh, up with my trademark attorney, who's Joey Vitale, a lot of you know him, um, Within two days, I received a package in the mail that was completely had nothing to do with with what I hired him for. It was just a gift and it was very themed around their branding. Um, but it really uh, gave me a, a, the warm and fuzzies. And I recorded a podcast episode about it, promoted his firm. Um, but, it, it, you know, it, it was it was different than what you're used to experiencing. So when you want to be you want to set yourself apart, you want to be different. You got to think about these things that the professionals are telling you this is important. Uh, don't just, you know, throw it to the side, but think about how you can implement something like that in your firm. Um, and folks, uh, Jordan offered to answer any questions. Uh, we do have a, a minute to do that. So if you have any questions, just drop it in. I will tell you, uh, Jordan, we've got you've got a fan here. Um, 
Anne Marie Bowen Jordan is amazing, uh, but she did have a question, so let's bring that up. Uh, so sure. she wants to know, tell us more about e-signing. Can you have a client sign a pleading or court paper by e-sign and then file that with the court, or are you just talking about e-signing for the representation letter? Best e-signing tool to use. So I am talking about it from the standpoint of e-signing a contract, a representation agreement. Um, in terms of e-signing court documents, I think that's going to be okay in the majority of jurisdictions. There may be some rules in specific states. And I know for like estate planning documents, there's some things that have to have wet signatures depending upon state statutes. But to the extent that it's okay, because ultimately it's going to get, like in Florida, it's everything's going to get e-filed anyway. So if your client's e-signing for you to e-file, um, I don't see the problem with it unless you've got a specific judge or a statute or a specific type of pleading that needs a wet signature. Uh, that will make it easier. But the e-sign on the contract is the biggest thing for me. And then um, Moshe, just to circle back to a couple things you said, in terms of the impact of this, by tracking these numbers, if you are signing up 10 cases a month and you can increase your close rate by 10%, you can add one case per month or maybe more if, you're, if your close rate's really that low. And if your average case value is, let's call it you know, 2,500 bucks, one case a month becomes $30,000 over the course of the year. And you can take time to tweak your marketing side and you can take time to tweak the sales side and then you run all this for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days and see what changes increase that close rate more. What changes get you a better ROI on all those marketing? What changes get you more reviews from clients? What changes get you happier clients at that onboarding process? And it's just, it's amazing to see what you can do by having this sort of science experiment with it over and over again. Awesome, Jordan. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge. Uh, folks, we're going to be bringing Maddie on in just a moment, but I'm just going to wrap up for Jordan. Uh, just so you know where to go to download the replay and resources. He, he put his QR code up there. If you were driving, you weren't able to scan it. Uh, we're compiling all of this for you, and it's all going to be emailed to you. However, if you're first watching this on Facebook and you did not register for this event, we're not going to email it to you. So you want to go to ProfitWithLaw.com forward slash planning replay profitwithlaw.com forward slash planning replay and you'll be able to access the replay page where we're linking up all the resources from all of our speakers onto that page. Now, um, if you've been trying to grow your firm and find that it's going slower than you'd like, maybe you're putting in way too many hours, you're taking home way too little income. If that's you, you identify with that, then you're what we call a struggling law firm owner and struggling sucks right? Nobody wants to be a struggling law firm owner. The ones who are successful, they're proud, they're free. If you want to be a proud and free law firm owner and you want to find out uh, how that can be you, uh, you can book a free coaching session with one of our coaches at profitwithlaw.com forward slash free coaching. Now, just so you know what we cover on this session, uh, our coaches are going to take you through a process that's going to help create a crystal clear vision for your ultimate law firm success and the perfect lifestyle you'd like your firm to provide. It's going to uncover hidden challenges that may be sabotaging the growth of your firm and keeping you working too many hours. When you leave the session, you're going to leave renewed, re-energized, and inspired to turn your firm into a highly profitable revenue-generating machine that practically runs itself. Now, we help step lawyers through this process, and we work with them annually to create those positive results. And my team, when they do that coaching session with you, my team is going to also offer you to join our elite lawyer program. So it's not cheap, um, but if you're, you're just fed up and, and done with the results that you've been getting and you want to flip the script on your firm and you want to turn it into a successful uh, wealth generating machine that's going to significantly, significantly impact your future generations from the work that you're doing today and really truly make you proud and free to live the life that you want, then you're definitely going to want to join me in that journey. Um, but it all starts with a free coaching session, which is impactful by itself, whether or not you want to join me on that journey. That's it for this week's episode of Profit With Law. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with at least one person. Imagine how many lives we can change if we each shared this episode. Another way to share the episode is on social media. We appreciate your support and look forward to you joining us again next week.